The topics and opinions expressed in the following show are solely those of the hosts and their guests and not those of W4CY Radio, its employees, or affiliates. We make no recommendations or endorsements for radio show programs, services, or products mentioned on air or on our web. No liability, explicit or implied, shall be extended to W4CY Radio or its employees or affiliates. Any questions or comments should be directed to those show hosts. Thank you for choosing W4CY Radio. What's working on purpose anyway? Each week, we ponder the answer to this question. People ache for meaning and purpose at work, to contribute their talents passionately, and know their lives really matter. They crave being part of an organization that inspires them and helps them grow into realizing their highest potential. Business can be such a force for good in the world, elevating humanity. In our program, we provide guidance and inspiration to help usher in this world we all want, working on purpose. Now, here's your host, Dr. Elise Cortez. Hi there, and welcome back to the Working on Purpose program. Thanks for tuning in again this week. I'm your host, Dr. Elise Cortez, joining you live from Dallas, which is home base for me. If you don't know me yet, I'm a management consultant specializing in meaning and purpose, organizational logotherapist, inspirational speaker, social scientist, and author. My team and I help companies discover and articulate their purpose to thread it through their culture and operations. We work with forward-thinking or forward-reaching organizations to develop inspirational leaders who create cultures where people actually want to come to work and do their best. And we provide programs like the Grab Your Gusto that enable individual team members to discover and unleash their passion and purpose at work to catalyze fulfillment, engagement, and productivity. You can learn more about us and how we can work together at EliseCortez.com. With us today is Marshall Mosher, founder and CEO of Vestigo, which utilizes the mental performance enhancing power of action sports to create real and virtual reality based experiences that train teams to embrace adaptability, foster a mindset of innovation, and overcome our biologic desire for stability and comfort. He's also the host of the podcast, Inside the Adventure. We'll be talking today about the state of today's remote workforce, how virtual reality can be leveraged to enhance learning experiences, and the work Marshall and his team do at Vestigo to elevate team connection and performance. He joins us today from the road. Marshall, welcome to Working on Purpose. Thanks for having me here, Dr. Cortez. And so great to have you. And we got to start first, speaking of you being on the road, I was going to say you're calling in from Atlanta, in which you might be, but you l- let's talk about where you're actually joining us for, for the show. I'm looking at what looks to be like a vehicle with all kinds of equipment behind you. So where are you? Yeah, that's right. So uh, speaking of meaning and purpose, uh, I personally love the intersection of technology and venture, both with what my company does and what I do personally. So uh, I love all different types of action sports. Those are the things that make me come alive personally. So I've been traveling and working remotely from a camper van for the past year, going to different cities that have really amazing combinations of tech startup hubs, but also adventure sports. So right now I'm here in Telluride, uh, parked right at the base of the mountain, actually. That is so amazing. And we're going to talk more about your love of adventure sports here and probably the second segment. But what I want to do first, Marshall, because I think you have a really unique vantage point on this is... I want to talk about the the state of today's workforce, particularly the re- remote workforce, because I have clients that are just hurting, trying to figure out how to make this work and address it. Right. So, um, you know, I think we've kind of kind of come to the place of that. This idea of remote work is more than a passing fad these days. And leaders are struggling. They're, they're in pain to keep their teams connected, performing and innovating. So will you share from your vantage point what you're seeing, like literally the road warrior, what are you seeing with companies and their remote teams today? What's going on for you? Yeah, well, as you said already, remote work is here to stay in some capacity. And most of our clients are working either fully remotely or hybrid work structure with their teams. Um, and even with a hybrid structure, that's just less opportunities for people to be able to get together in person and build those meaningful relationships. But even when you are together in person in the office, meaningful relationships is the key word there that still don't really get that many opportunities to do even for in-person teams. So we've taken all the psychology behind what creates meaningful relationships, a lot of Brene Brown's work on vulnerability, a lot of other psychological research in terms of neuroscience of what actually creates um, deeper relationships and the ability for us to you know, remember those experiences. And action sports are actually a great tool for that. Of course, when you think action sports, you're probably thinking of some TikTok or Instagram video you saw, of some guy base jumping off a cliff, and you probably <laughs> yeah. say, I would never do that in a million years. <laughs> but there are plenty of sports and opportunities to challenge our comfort zone 
challenge our perceived limits that are incredibly safe and accessible. So when we started, we would use those real life adventure sport experiences like rappelling, for example, it's sort of the inverse of climbing. You start at the top of the cliff, mm -hmm. you walk down with a rope attached to you, incredibly easy, going with gravity, anyone can do it. But when you're standing on the edge of that cliff, only supported by a rope, your brain is telling you all kinds of <laughs> things to reasons why you should not be there. But it's a great <laughs> opportunity for us to push through that fear, get outside of our comfort zone. And oftentimes when we do those experiences on the other side of those, we form deeper relationships with the people we do them with and a deeper connection with ourselves, our ability to realize that challenge is really all up here. It's a mindset uh, focused um, uh, thing that we have to overcome. So now we're actually using virtual reality adventure sports as an even more accessible opportunity to create those powerful opportunities for teams to come together, regardless of whether in the office or virtual, and go through these experiences that still create the same emotional reaction as that person on the edge of the cliff, like I described in their repelling experience, which wasn't possible a few years back. So this is brand new in terms of the technology being able to recreate that type of experience and that type of impact. So now we're, of course, using VR headsets for companies that have either bought them for their employees or companies who haven't will ship out the headsets to all the employees for that experience to create those impact building opportunities to build the relationships that we so desperately need in today's remote work culture. Mm hmm. Awesome. That is so awesome. Now, if I, I think I remember if I read if I read this right, Marshall, that um, a few years, maybe up to a few years ago, you were actually focused on providing more of those actual adventure experiences. And I don't know exactly when the virtual reality came into play for you. When was that? Yeah, so we actually started the company at Singularity University, which is a startup accelerator. Um, it was housed out at the NASA AIM Center at the time, partnered with Google, uh, very focused on using future exponential technology to create positive impact for problems that might not even exist yet. So few, very future oriented. And that's when we came up with the idea of using virtual reality to solve this problem of how we connect as individuals in a remote work culture. Of course, this is years before COVID, but a lot of the experts at the time were saying that our future of work would be very remote in the future. Of course, COVID accelerated that, but we wanted to use virtual reality to solve that problem. But we, we had a big problem as a company, VR tech wasn't ready yet. So do we just pause the company? Do we shut it down and restart it when VR is there? We figured we would come up with the most basic form of an, MB, an MVP, a minimal viable product in the startup lingo, uh, which is instead of using virtual adventure experiences, just use real adventure experiences, see if companies would, for one, even want to take their team on something like that and what the impact would be. So we actually measured the impact of those experiences before VR was ready. And then in about 2017, 2018, when the tech was ready, we did both um, at the same time. Uh, and then COVID, of course, forced us to go completely virtual. But the virtual reality side of things was always the long term goal. Mm, fascinating. What an interesting story. So glad I asked that. I didn't know that. That's fascinating. Okay, so let's do this for a second, Marshall. I want to park a virtual reality for just a second because I want to talk more about that also again in the second segment, more specifically for our listeners and viewers who really don't know much about it. And but I want to do what I want to do now is just address some of the issues and opportunities that are present in the business world today. So um, I know that some companies have literally given up entirely in working with remote teams just because of the challenges they've encountered. Like it, it doesn't work. We're not productive. We can't communicate, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm interested to know if you could share with us what are some of the hallmarks of companies whose remote workforces are working well for them? What's going on for them that is actually right? Yeah. So um, it's a tough question because there's so many factors that go into it. But if I had to choose one thing, I would say they're taking the budget of what they used to have to pay for office space, which as we all know ah, is a massive ah, budget. Ah, ah. And they're putting that budget into opportunities to engage their team, which ah. generally is a much smaller budget. Usually, uh, unfortunately, team development and team building um, is, is a smaller budget than it should be. Um, and companies, unfortunately, uh, deal with the repercussions of that in turnover and retention, and the amount of yeah. money it takes to recruit someone, all those recruiter fees and to train them. Um, so now I'm seeing a lot of companies taking a little bit of that budget for office space and putting it into team development. Uh, for example, Pinterest has gone completely remote and they're doing something similar where they're empowering each of their teams to uh, their team leader to come up with opportunities that are unique to engage their team. And one of those teams actually chose to use one month's budget to just buy everyone on their team a virtual reality headset 
Mm. And then the following month's budgets to use different opportunities in virtual in virtual reality to be able to engage their team. That's just one example. But uh, I'm seeing a lot of companies do that. And it seems like the ones who are focusing on their people are the ones that are not dealing with the, um, you know, the uh, what do they call it? The the mass resignation. Uh, the great resignation. Yes. Right. Exactly. Of, of everyone uh, realizing that um, it's an opportunity for a change. The companies that focus on really engaging their people are the ones that are doing the best from what I can tell um, on that front. Mm -hmm. That was a gem, Marshall. Thank you so much. Let's take what we were paying for office rent and office space and put it into developing and connecting people. Brilliant. And that's not exactly. just because you and I are both in the people space, right? <laughs> that's not just because of, that's not the only reason it's brilliant, but it, it just is. So so from what I've kind of come to, to gather, Marshall, as I've watched this thing and studied this thing as I really have come to believe that the pandemic has forced something of like a union strike among talent today. And so what I mean by that is, you know, talent has got the upper hand, if you will. It's like they they are they want flexibility and they don't necessarily want to return to the office. It's really not 100 percent of the time. And I feel like we've been given this really swift kick upstairs. This is a new world, a new frontier. And I don't think there's any way that we're probably really ever going to go back to something else. And so finding an opt optimal way to support and engage the workforce without immediate physical presence seems pretty critical to me. What's your vantage point on, on that? I agree. And that brings up an interesting point that I was just talking with a friend actually about the other day. One of my friends works for one of the top consulting firms uh, who's now requiring their team to come back in person. And they're experiencing a lot of uh, a lot of turnover, a lot of people leaving um, because of mm -hmm. that decision. So regardless of whether companies are coming back together in person, which generally is being in person is a better way to build relationships, or if they're completely remote, companies are still having the same problem of how do we retain our talent? And how do we uh, build that talent? So, of course, I'm a little biased, obviously, but I think virtual reality is... Um, one of the most powerful tools we can use. Of course, it's not the end all be all. There's plenty of things we need to do. But at the very least, I would encourage everyone listening today to find a friend who has an Oculus Quest headset. A lot of people have been buying them for their kids because virtual reality generally in the beginning was a tool for for video games so a lot of kids are getting them just find a friend with an oculus quest headset go over to their house or if you're worried about covid let leave them on the front door and just borrow it and see for yourself what it can do it's way better than it was three four years ago and i think it's a massive game changer for an incredibly cheap price it's only you know, 2.99 per headset uh for employees to be able to feel like you're together and to describe what that's like for anyone who ha hasn't done it uh if you've seen the movie ready player one it's a really great Hollywood portrayal of what the future of VR could look like. Steven Spielberg movie. Of course, we're not there yet, but it's a great portrayal of what it most likely will be. Uh, where we are now, though, is similar. You're in a virtual environment where you can walk across the virtual room. You can pick up uh, you know, a virtual object. If you're at a virtual happy hour, you can actually pick up a virtual drink. You can walk over to a friend who is in an avatar form, kind of looks like a cartoon Pixar character version of themselves, and shake their hand. It actually feels like you're together in person. And then, of course, outside of the benefit of being together in person, you can also recreate office space. You can stream your computer into virtual reality. You can work from wherever you want, whether it's a space station or a waterfall or a beach. Uh, and you can um, be able to have those whiteboard moments where you're standing next to a uh, um, you know, whiteboard and putting up sticky notes in virtual reality. So, so many collaborative tools, creative tools, opportunities for feeling together in person. And then, of course, our specialty is creating meaningful experiences through virtual reality to be able to build those deeper relationships. So all kinds of things you can do. Um, of course, again, I'm biased because I run a virtual reality company, but I think 2022 is going to be the year people start to realize how impactful virtual reality is, especially from a B2B standpoint, because right now it's mostly consumer focused. Mm -hmm. Which is why I wanted to have you on the show. Now, we have a question here from Ira, who's listening in here live, and he is asking, are there industries outside of tech that are more receptive to virtual reality? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Most of our clients are actually not in the tech space. Uh, a lot are for sure. Just tech companies are more uh, aware of opportunities to use tech for their team. Uh, we've worked with plenty of accounting firms, law firms, uh, professional services that aren't really tech focused at all. Um, the biggest challenge that everyone has, and you'd be surprised, even the tech companies have this challenge, is people navigating virtual reality for the first time. 
remember the first time you got on a laptop or a computer and you're like, <laughs> what is this trackpad thing I have to draw mm. with my finger? It's, and that sounds ridiculous now, but that's kind of where we are with virtual reality because imagine a mouse on a computer, the way you navigate virtual reality is three-dimensional space. It's completely different. So teaching people and employees how to navigate it is a little bit of a challenge, but that comes with all new technology, just like the computer, you know, the touchscreen smartphones, um, pretty much everything that we've ever had. Uh, and sometimes it's a little bit harder for people who aren't directly working in technology. Um, but that's not to say that everyone can't do it. Uh, we've worked with all kinds of people. And usually in the first experience we do with a company, uh, we actually have Zoom as a resource. We can jump on a video call, show them how to hold the controller, make sure they're not holding it upside down or have the headset <laughs> on backwards. <laughs> You'd be surprised. Uh, and help coach people through that first experience. Um, Ira, thanks so much for engaging with us. He says, uh, just upgraded to Oculus 2. I'm an older boomer. Virtual reality just isn't for kids. Yay, way to go, Ira. We couldn't get our 90-year-old parents to give up the headsets. Yay, Ira, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's and awesome. What I'll, I'll, what I'll also say to that, Ira, thank you so much. It's so cool to have you weigh in on this. Um, you know, last year was a big deal in terms of, I know a lot of my work went online too. And so instead of you know, doing leadership development courses in person in, 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 a, in a conference room on site at a client. We did a lot of it through Zoom. And we taught a lot of people how to use and inter interact with, you know, Zoom and, you know, other sort of tools that just really were, you know, Menti Media, for example, fun little interactive tool. And it was, once they got it, they were so empowered that they knew how to do it. And it was, it just allowed them to go to the next step. So to your point, Marshall, right? We don't, let's not forget, ladies and gentlemen, we all come into this world, a helpless baby who can't feed itself, talk, walk, anything. Yeah, we can become people that literally send men and women to, to the moon. So, you know, there's all kinds of space to learn as, and as I was also teaching us. So yeah. excited. And also don't forget, our kids can teach us a lot of well, Absolutely. The best thing that we advise people to do for the first time is give it to their kids, let them figure it out, and they can teach you. They they figure oh, it out in like five seconds. It's true. My 18 year old daughter is my best teacher, so she she can't can't get too far away from me. Um, let's grab our first break. This is so fun. Thanks, Marshall. I'm your host, Absolutely. Elise Cortez. We've been on the air with Marshall Mosher. He's the founder and CEO of Vestigo, which utilizes the mental performance enhancing power of action sports to create real and virtu virtual reality based experiences that train teams to embrace adaptability, foster a mindset of innovation, and overcome our biological desire for stability and comfort. We've been talking a bit about the state of the, the today's workforce and virtual or remote teams. After the break, we're gonna talk a little bit more about virtual reality. What is it? How do we use it in learning and how we can better extend it and extrapolate it? Stay with us, we'll be right back. Dr. Elise Cortez is a management consultant specializing in meaning and purpose, an inspirational speaker and author. She helps companies visioneer for greater purpose among stakeholders and develop purpose-inspired leadership and meaning-infused cultures that elevate fulfillment, performance, and commitment within the workforce. To learn more or to invite Elise to speak to your organization, please visit her at EliseCortez.com. Let's talk about how to get your employees working on purpose. This is Working on Purpose with Dr. Elise Cortez. To reach our program today or to open a conversation with Elise, send an email to Elise, A-L-I-S-E, -E, at EliseCortez.com. Now, back to Working on Purpose. Thanks for staying with us and welcome back to Working on Purpose. Before we go back into the program, I'd like to invite you to check out the book that I put out last November of 2020. It's called Purpose Ignited, How Inspiring Leaders Ignite Passion and Elevate Cause. I wrote it to awaken readers to their passion and their purpose and, and to help develop them into inspirational leaders that actually work in a way that invites people to bring their best and make their best contribution and do business that betters the world. So I'm happy about that. It's out there. I'd love for you to check it out. It's also the basis of my programs that I do for leadership as well as the Grab Your Gusto for all employees. If you're just joining the program, my guest today is Marshall Mosher. He's the founder and CEO of Vestigo, which utilizes the mental performance enhancing power of action sports to create real and virtual reality based experiences that train teams to embrace adaptability, foster a mindset of innovation and overcome our biological desire for stability and comfort. He's also the host of the podcast Inside the Inside the Adventure. I'm your host, Elise Cortez. 
So for this next section, Marsha, what I want to do is I really want to focus on virtual reality as a tool. And I know for a, a lot of people who probably are tuning in are probably learn, just tuning in to learn more about what it is actually. So let's just start there. Uh, now that we kind of cover a little something about the virtual you know, workforce that we're in today, what is virtual reality in your words? That's a great question. Uh, I know it can get confusing and we're all hearing everything about the metaverse and all those things. So I'll kind of break it down for everyone. <laughs> so virtual reality is the generic term for any type of recreation of the reality you're in. Um, that could be something like, you know, a, a movie set with, you know, 360 video around you. Um, it could be a headset that you slide your phone into and allows you to see in three, you know, 360 to move your head around and see different perspectives of different environments. Those are all virtual reality. But when people talk about virtual reality, they're generally specifically referencing a type of virtual reality. Um, that's what's called six degrees of freedom virtual reality, which means that you can not only look around, but you can move around. If I take a step forward in my virtual world, I'll actually be moving forward in what I see. I can pick up virtual objects. I can shake virtual hands of other virtual avatars that I'm actually interacting with. And it actually feels like you're together in person. That's not possible with 360 video, which is technically virtual reality. And that's what we had years ago. So a lot of people have a misconception on virtual reality that it's the Google Cardboards, the Oculus Go, the thing you slide your cell phone into. It's not wrong. It is virtual reality, but it's not what people are talking about today. Um, you also have a difference between two different types of virtual reality in terms of the six degrees of freedom virtual reality. You have a standalone headset, the Oculus Quest and the Oculus Quest 2. Those are great examples. And when I say standalone, I mean it does not need any external hardware for it to work. Other headsets require sensors in the four corners of the room called lighthouses. They require a big gaming computer to process all the graphics you're seeing. And when I say gaming computer, I don't mean MacBook Pro. I mean a tower Microsoft computer with a high-end graphics card. Uh, those have much higher end uh, versions of virtual reality in terms of what you're seeing. It actually feels like you're in a Pixar movie or a high-end video game, which is pretty amazing. But requires a lot more tech and a lot more things. So the standalone headsets, the Oculus Quest and the Oculus Quest 2, while the graphics aren't as good, that's what most people are talking about when they say virtual reality. I know there are a lot of things there, but like I said in the first half of the show, find someone with an Oculus Quest 2 or Quest 1 and just try it for yourself. Uh -huh. By the way, I have to share with you, uh, the, the first time I think I really came across the word meta universe was when my daughter introduced me to the Spider-Man series, right? The, the Marvel series. And actually just last night I was in the theater watching Spider-Man The Way Home. And we it's do, pretty good. We, it's pretty darn good. And it definitely showcases meta universes. So um, just, it is cool, the space that we're stepping into. And I just, I'm so excited to have you on because I think you really are pulling us literally into the future. And it's, it's really great to be able, yeah, it's great to learn from you. So next, what I want to do is since a lot of the work that I do inside organization is about teaching, it's about developing leaders, it's about developing, you know, the capacity to be able to communicate effectively, cultivate emotional touch, all these kind of things that, that happen inside um, developing an organization and, and connecting culture. So I'm interested in your perspective, what you know at, about how virtual reality is augmenting the classroom learning experience or environments of companies or clients that you're working with. Yeah, there's there's a lot of things virtual reality can do and will do in the future. Augmenting learning and classroom style setting is definitely one of them. Um, I always like to point out references from movies because I think Hollywood does a great job of portraying <laughs> what could be. Mm -hmm. There's actually a scene in, I think it's the first of the new Star Trek movies where uh, like Kid Spock or one of the people from his planet is in this pod. You see this room of like a bunch of different pods and there's 360 video around them. And they have their own little artificial intelligence teacher. Um, that's a little bit different from where virtual reality is going, but but portrays a lot of the same factors. We'll be able to be in an environment that's completely customizable. We can create the classroom into anything we want, which means every day is a field trip and you can learn in whatever environment is best for that kid. You can also tailor the content to that individual who's learning as well. The other students in the classroom or the teacher itself eventually might even be an AI teacher who specifically customizes the content to that person. Now I know it's not very fun to make relationships with fake artificial intelligence video game characters but the point i want to get across is that it can be much more customizable and a lot more immersive mm, awesome that's so awesome it's so exciting 
um, you know, certainly I, you know, frankly, and, and it's selfishly, another reason I wanted to have you on the show is I, I, I learned something from each and every one of my guests, Marshall. I've been doing the show for almost seven years now. And I shudder to think who I would be if I didn't host this show because I, I learned so much. And so obviously, you know, I do have an online digital platform where I'm not releasing my courses. And I'm interested, of course, it'd be so cool to see how can I make those things sing and become much more interesting, you know, through virtual reality. So it's just really promising what you're doing and what you're what you're showing the world. Thanks. Yeah, another great analogy of how people can, like yourself, go out and actually make their own virtual environments. Think of the internet when it first came out. To make a website, you had to be a developer. There's no other way. Yep, and you had I remember. to do a lot of, yeah, a lot of uh, education on how to do that. Now, almost no websites are coded from scratch. This whole no code movement of using things like Square, Squarespace, uh, WordPress, um, uh, yep. I think Workflow, a, a ton of different websites. I think even HubSpot has one build that website for you with no coding experience that's also going to happen more so in the future but already is starting to happen in virtual reality we have world builders you don't have to code anything so of course it'll be a lot easier for people to make those environments uh, and to be able to utilize virtual reality as a tool and and do you know off the top of your head a, a, an example of a company that's using virtual reality well in their their learning environment well, Facebook is probably the company that's done the most for virtual reality. Um, they bought Oculus a long time ago, and they've okay. been the ones that have been mm -hmm. building out the hardware for Oculus as well as a lot of software. Uh, and then in that platform, they're creating a lot of opportunities like these world builders uh, for people to create the own, their own worlds. They're creating office space as well, opportunities for virtual engagement. Um, I think they are working on a classroom style thing, um, but a lot of companies are starting to do that now. I believe Microsoft is doing that um, and several others. I'm, I'm sure, even if it's not public, that all the big tech companies are doing it. But you know, mm -hmm. Okay, know. got it's it. Cool, public. cool. All right, so now what I want to do is I want to dive in more into you. You are a fabulously interesting human being, Marsha Mosier. And I Thanks. think that you, this, you're welcome. And I just love how you thrive in adventure and live by this mindset in your personal life. And you, you're constantly ch seeking to challenge your own limits. And I know, as I found out, as a class five whitewater paddler, paraglider pilot, mountain biker, snowboarder, kiteboarder, scuba diver, caver, climber, and jet suit pilot with Gravity Industries. I love, of love, that you have folded all these personal loves into the expression of your work. To me, that is just smashing. It's just a specific, Thanks. your niche. So can you see a bit more about how have you been able to, one, you know, where does that all that energy and dynamism come from? And two, you know, finding a way to actually put it into your workspace is just phenomenal. Thanks. Well, I really love what your coffee mug says, the do what you love, because I think that's the most <laughs> important thing. Um, and I, I spent a lot of time trying to f figure out what it was that I wanted to do. I, uh, I initially went to the University of Georgia uh, as a bio and psych double major for pre-med, realized in my junior year I didn't want to go to med school, added an economics major, realized that business was fun, but like kind of boring unless you're applying it to something you love. So then I did a master's in public health administration, really just honestly to spend more time at UGA because I loved it there and it was a great opportunity to help <laughs> figure out what I wanted to do, but also what I didn't want to do. And at the end of six years, I had three majors and a master's and still had no idea what I wanted to do, but I took this entrepreneurship class in the last semester of that MPA program and fell in love with this concept that we can create opportunities to both balance our passions and our professions in a way that gives us personal freedom and flexibility, but also allows us to be innovative and creative. And right after that, I went to Singularity, which is just more reinforcement of uh, what the future of technology would look like um, and helped me to really realize that I love this intersection between adventure, technology and entrepreneurship. And I was a guide, by the way, for the outdoor rec program. That was my campus job as a student. So that was when I was getting into all these adventure sports because I didn't really know that much about it before. And I knew I actually didn't think I'd do something professionally in that space. But I did know that I loved that space. And that's what personally um, just helped me grow as an individual. And then go th going through Singularity and doing a lot of research in terms of what virtual reality can do and what adventure sports do to us personally, I realized that there was this big opportunity to use virtual reality to create accessible and impactful opportunities to create deep relationships. And we found the niche of, well, B2B remote teams, which, you know, five years ago, wasn't really even a thing. Um, 
But personally, I, I really think life's too short to not do what you love. Um, and I was really thrilled to find that intersection because I know that's really hard uh, for a lot of us to figure out what we can do professionally. That's also um, empowering us to do what we love personally. And it really wasn't until this past year that I really got to like fully embody that and start traveling in this camper van because a lot of what we were doing was in-person things. And even when we weren't doing in-person things, we had to take in-person meetings. And pre-COVID, it was kind of weird to show up on a Zoom call from a camper van. But now after COVID, it's fine. It's <laughs> right standard now. Yeah. Right. So being able to work and live right next to the things that I love, like from the base of the mountain, it's how on the top of the mountain, I'll go paraglide in the mornings for an hour instead of like an hour run. Those are the things that really empower me to be my best self. So it's a great combination. It is a great combination, Marshall, and I so applaud it. Another reason I wanted to showcase you because, you know, life is amazingly short. It really is. Um, just yesterday, I celebrated, well, I, I should say I observed the three year passing of my mother. She only died when she was 73 years old. That's just no time at all, right? So, really, another reason because you just love life. And so, now today, just if you could say a little bit about, you know, how are you working with organizations? You, I love that you found this niche, B2B remote teams. How are you working with them? And we'll talk more about what does that look like you know, in the next section, but cue it up for us. Yeah, so we work with two types of companies um, on two types of things. Uh, in terms of the types of companies, the first type are companies that have not done anything in virtual reality. They've not bought headsets for their team, but they're interested at the very least in learning more about VR. What we'll do is we have about 50 VR headsets, not a ton, but enough to send out headsets to each individual person at their house or at their office. And we all meet up in virtual reality to have their first introductory VR experience. Um, and it's a great way to bring the team together for the first time in person without being together in person. Um, those experiences uh, are generally more focused on just gathering the team together, exploring a new technology, having fun. We do focus a little bit on leadership development for those, but generally that's kind of a future session, you know, session two, three, four. And then we work with companies who've already bought headsets for their team. They've realized remote work is here to stay. Investing in VR really isn't that expensive compared to you know, millions of dollars in office space. Um, and they've bought headsets for most of their team, like Accenture, who's one of our clients, bought 70,000 headsets for a big wow. portion of their team. And then we'll work with those types of companies on a recurring basis to create opportunities to both solidify and, and build stronger relationships, but also focus on really key elements of leadership development in an experiential way. When I say experiential, I know I described this a little bit before, but think like a Tony Robbins firewalk. If anyone's ever heard of that, yeah. you, know, you yeah, walk sure. across fire, he teaches you how to walk on coal is something you never thought you could do. Well, we're doing things similar to that in a leadership development, keynote style, experiential way that creates the same mental state that you'd have if you were walking across coals, creates an opportunity for us to get outside of our comfort zone, to push our own limits, to see how far we can go and be a better version of ourselves ultimately, but also to connect deeper with the people we go through those experiences with. Um, those are more focused on companies who have their own headsets um, because we do focus on a recurring basis, um, usually quarterly, sometimes more often, uh, as an opportunity to consistently reinforce those themes and work on different themes um, sometimes as well. Um, so those are the two types of events we do. Some focus on fun, some focus on leadership development for companies that either are interested in VR or have already invested in VR. Mm -hmm. Awesome. We'll have more about that after we come back. But let's, let's take our last break. I'm Elise Cortez, your host. We are on the air with Marshall Mosher, who's the founder and CEO of Vistigo, which utilizes the mental performance enhancing power of action sports to create real and virtual reality based experiences that train teams to embrace adaptability, foster a mindset of innovation, and overcome our biological desire for stability and comfort. We've been talking about virtual reality as an opportunity to accelerate learning. After the break, we're going to talk about how to leverage virtual reality in team building. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Dr. Elise Cortez is a management consultant specializing in meaning and purpose, an inspirational speaker and author. She helps companies visioneer for greater purpose among stakeholders and develop purpose-inspired leadership and meaning-infused cultures that elevate fulfillment, performance, and commitment within the workforce. To learn more or to invite Elise to speak to your organization, please visit her at EliseCortez.com. Let's talk about how to get your employees working on purpose.
This is Working on Purpose with Dr. Elise Cortez. To reach our program today or to open a conversation with Elise, send an email to Elise, A L I S E, at EliseCortez.com. Now, back to Working on Purpose. Thanks for staying with us and welcome back to Working on Purpose. I got to give you another update here as well. On just August of 2021, um, I was able to get out a second book, and this one isn't actually an anthology. It's called Passionately Striving and Why. Um, and it's really an anthology of women who persevere mightily to live their purpose. I scoured the globe to find them. So we literally have stories from Australia to Zambia. And they are very, very personal, intimate stories of how they discovered their purpose and what they're doing from it. We hope that it showcases that purpose is available to anyone, anywhere, and that when you actually work from purpose, you can really make a difference in the world. So it's an invitation. Hope you'll check that out as well. If you're just joining us, my guest is Marshall Mosier. He is the founder and CEO of Estigo. He is also the host of the podcast, Inside the Adventure. I'm your host, Dr. Elise Cortez. So for this last section here, Marshall, what I want to get into is, is really some of more of your experience as to experience and understanding and research as to why virtual reality works in the in these kind of situations. And I was blown away that you were a triple you know, major. I was like, okay, this guy is completely an overachiever. I got to meet him. Uh, so first I want to talk about, I want to understand how does your research in neuroscience tell you, what does it tell you about using the, the, your approach to virtual reality, to team building and, and to um, even just building connections? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so to answer that question, we really have to start a little bit more basic than virtual reality. So virtual reality is just a tool. It's not the destination. And the tool is able to recreate something that we experience you know, throughout our lives. And it's experiences generally that are challenging us, so challenge-based experiences that get us outside of our comfort zone mm -hmm. where we have to push through and overcome that challenge with someone else. And the ability to overcome that challenge not only makes us stronger, but it makes the relationship between the people stronger. It's the hero's journey. It's the theme of pretty much every Hollywood movie these days. You've seen it a million times. You've experienced it a million times. Biologically evolving as humans, those are the experiences that build our tribes. Quite literally, thousands of years ago, our tribe was the people we would be struggling with, you know, surviving the winter with, you know, hunting a whatever, caribou with, woolly mammoth. Um, those experiences are really what build relationships. Um, but there's a key to that. It's really challenge-based experiences. Of course, regular experiences build relationships too. But the psychology shows us that when we get outside of our comfort zone and we're vulnerable about the fact that those challenges are hard, we're able to bond deeper with the people who go through those experiences. And ideally, if we can overcome the experience together, the relationship is even stronger. Virtual reality is just replicating the ability to have a challenge-based experience that biologically feels real. And when I say biologically feels real, I mean, like when I describe the repelling experiences we used to do. Previously to virtual reality, there's only one way to have that experience like you're going to die is to put yourself in a situation where you think you're going to die. And of course, we don't want to have any actual risk involved. So we would do things like repelling where the risk is less than the drive to the actual site. But the impact is really strong. So you've never done it before in your brain, your amygdala is releasing all those chemicals that tell you you're leaning off a cliff. Biologically and evolutionarily, that's not a good thing. Um, and now we can recreate that exact same feeling and the release of the exact same neurotransmitters in virtual reality without the need to actually be there. And I know it sounds ridiculous because the logical part of our brain, the prefrontal cortex, it doesn't forget that we're in our office or in our living room. But the amygdala, which is responsible for regulating fear, is a deeper part of the brain that evolved First, and that actually isn't quite as connected to the prefrontal cortex, the logic side of things, as we like to think. Um, so we can replicate that feeling of fear, that challenge, um, and the opportunity to overcome that challenge in virtual reality. And I think that is the single biggest opportunity that virtual reality has, in my opinion. I'm, of course, biased. Um, but I think that's more impactful than creating an opportunity to feel like you're together physically in the same space, creating virtual office space, playing VR video games, all the other tools that VR can be used for. I think the opportunity to feel like you're teleported into an environment that has real stakes and a real challenge, and you have to overcome that challenge with the people you're around, I think that's the game changer. Oh my gosh, I'm having so many ding, ding, ding going on right now, Marshall, because what I've come to in my own life, my own work, I'm very much out to help organizations to discover and articulate their purpose and their, their cultures, but also leaders, individual leaders on their journeys. And what I've come to understand is that 
a lot of people are just really comfortable and they they don't you know where i discover you know what what do we what do we know marshall that growth does not happen to us while we're sitting very comfortably sitting on the couch eating bonbons watching our favorite tv show that's, that's not right. when it occurs so i've often thought to myself wait a minute how do i find a way to get these people to be uncomfortable do i make them get a divorce do i you know throw them off a cliff do I give them some awful, terrible illness they have to give? You know, what do I do to inject some kind of uh, immediacy here? And you've just delivered it to me. Um, and that is so amazing because, y you know, you're right. We need something to be able to catalyze that, something, some kind of discomfort. So I'm, I have to imagine then if people do register the sensation in their amygdala, I have to believe then that their heart rate must increase. They must pers perspire. Is this all happening as well? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so uh, most of the experiences we do are, we do nowadays are virtual. Uh, but when we used to do in person experiences, we still every now and then, but we used to do a lot more of them. I mean, we had to bring like sanitization wipes to wipe the controllers down because they'd be covered in sweat. Oh <laughs> wow! Those mm -hmm. hands are literally sweating from yeah. the experience that it puts them in. So absolutely. Yeah, that's so great. Okay, so now I, that you did an impeccable job of helping us understand why virtual reality really works from a neuroscience perspective. Thank you. That was just stunning. Now I want to understand. Yeah, you, yeah, thank you. And one other really quick thing to throw out there from a neuroscience standpoint, if you want to go down that rabbit hole, uh, there's a really amazing organization <laughs> called the Flow Research Collective. Uh, founded by Stephen Kotler, who wrote a book called a bunch of books, The Rise of Superman um, and a bunch of other ones. He has some new ones out, but it's all about the neuroscience of flow state, which generally can be induced most effectively from action sports. And that's one of the reasons why action sports is such a powerful tool, because you don't have to, like you said, you know, put someone in a horrible situation, encourage them to get a divorce. I mean, maybe that's what's best for them, but you don't have to put them in those types of situations. You can recreate that feeling in a safe and fun way through action sports. So that's why action sports is such a powerful way to create those opportunities. Mm -hmm. He does a great job of putting that into a book. Stunning. Oh, I'm sure I need to check him out as well. I wrote, I wrote that down. Thank you so much for that. Um, okay, so what I want to do next is I, I, I want to understand how these experiences, being in this, these virtual reality experiences around action, adventure, etc., help empower to foster innovation. How does that work? What's the connection there? Yeah, so when we look at innovation and what it actually is, it's more of a psychological problem than anything else. Uh, and this is why startups routinely outperform large companies with way more resources. And it's because it's a mindset and a psychology factor. As a startup, you don't have much to lose. Your back's against a wall. You have a ticking clock of when you're going to run out of money, literally. Um, mm -hmm. So you have to make it happen and you don't care about taking risks to make it happen. So your appetite for risk, your appetite to get outside of your comfort zone is much higher than uh, most larger companies who are going to get a paycheck regardless of whether uh, their innovative idea succeeds or fails. So creating the really kind of practicing the muscle, just like at a gym of getting outside of your comfort zone and pushing through fear has been shown to directly translate into the ability to push through fear in the innovation process, to get outside of our comfort zone, to take a risk and to do something that might terrify us, especially because of our fear of failure. So when we can push through that fear of failure. Of course, it takes a team with a leader that uh, accepts that failure is a likely outcome, which that's probably the, the first step. Um, giving the team the opportunity to practice getting outside of their comfort zone to push through fear um, and to see what it's like on the other side is actually a really key indicator of teams being able to innovate and create uh, at a deeper level. Mm. Wow, that's really cool. Um, you know, for the longest time, I never thought of myself as being a creative person, but I've changed my mind about that. And um, <laughs> and I, I, I thrive in, in being creative. But the idea of innovation and being able to like almost institutionalize that is really, really compelling to me. So that's that opens something right there. Then the next thing that I want to talk about, and I think I might have already answered this for myself, but I already knew that I wanted to ask you how these experiences that you help provide through the adventure and, and, and virtual reality um, help bind a team together psychologically, psychologically and socially. And before you answer that, I then immediately went to, well, come on, you know, look at the people that serve in the armed forces and they go through these crazy things where their life is at risk and they never forget those people they served with. Or even people that went to college together and they went through the ups and downs of, you know, 
start making your way into a new environment, et cetera. So I think I know part of the answer to the question, but I just know you can answer it better than me. So what is it about these experiences that really binds people together psychologically and socially? Well, you actually pointed out a really good fact. There's two types of organizations who understand the importance of challenge and pain and suffering and overcoming adversity. The military. There's a lot of suffering when you go through the training programs in the military, and that makes mm -hmm. these teams uh, way higher performers than otherwise. And sports. So professional sports do the same thing. The biggest challenge with applying that and that model to the world of business is that the way they induce that challenge and pain and suffering is generally through physical activity. Physical activity is great, keeps us all healthy, but realistically, there is no way that your average company can put the team through a military style boot camp or even a professional sports style boot camp. Um, it just doesn't work. I mean, we've got so many different people with different um, abilities um, and you know, physical fitness levels, it just doesn't work. But we can recreate the same type of emotional state and that emotional state doesn't necessarily have to be correlated with anything that is physically challenging whatsoever. Um, of course, it's are often, often uh, correlated, but repelling, like, uh, like I mentioned before, that takes zero level of physical fitness um, and creates the same mental state of terror and overcoming that fear of the unknown. You're literally repelling into the unknown. So then a ton of analogies we can make on it in terms of how it relates to business. Mm -hmm. and there's no physical fitness challenge. And then, of course, virtual reality takes it one step further. We don't even have to travel to get there. We don't have yeah. to have any training. We don't have to have any guides to make sure even set up correctly. It's all virtual, but it still creates a degree of what you feel when you're actually there in person. It's not quite the same yet. It will be. The Matrix just came out, the new one. And, you know, eventually virtual reality might get to that point. Who knows? Um, mm -hmm. But it's definitely better than people think it is in terms of the impact that it creates. And then, of course, all the psychology around why those experiences create that impact. Um, a lot of great research, like I mentioned, from the Flow Research Collective in terms of the PhD research of why that actually creates that impact. Uh, but, yeah, there's a lot of psychology on that. Okay, awesome. This has been amazing, Marsha. We've already gotten to the end of the show already. It goes by so fast. You know the show is listened to by people around the world. This is all about trying to create a workplace where people actually want to come to work, do their do their best. We have inspirational leaders that lead them to their greatness, and we do business that betters the world. How would you like to close the show? Yeah. Um, I, I love encouraging people to take any opportunity you can to challenge your comfort zone and, and you know, push your perceived limits, even if it's something small. Um, there was a YouTube video that a friend sent me recently called, I think, 100 Days of, of Rejection, 100 Days of Failure, one of the two, <laughs> where it's a guy who just does little things. Like he tries to use a rock to buy a drink at Starbucks. Um, you know, Not very physically hard at all, but mentally it gets us outside of our comfort zone. It's a little embarrassing. Uh, and just try things to practice getting outside of our comfort zone. And you'll see that that muscle actually gets stronger in our ability to do that in the office place as well, whether it's through virtual reality, team and leadership development, or something small in our own personal lives. Don't be afraid to challenge that comfort zone whenever we have the opportunity. Great way to finish, Marshall. I am so glad to know you and have you in my life and in my circle now that you've been on the show. Thank you so much for sharing. It's just splendid. Same to you. Thanks so much for having me on. Absolutely. Listeners and viewers, if you want to learn more about Marshall Mosher and the work he and his team do at Vestigo, visit vestigo.co. That's V-E-S-T-I-G-O dot C-O. Last week, if you missed the live show, you always you can always catch a re recorded podcast. We are on the air with actually, believe it or not, Santa Ronnie Watson for a special holiday gathering celebrating that Christmas can live every moment throughout the year. It was his third appearance on the program. It was great to have him back. Next week, we'll be on the air with Dr. Woody Woodward talking about the great resignation, the future of work, workforce trends, and the, and the like. See you there. Remember that works at least a third of our lives, so let's work on purpose. We hope you've enjoyed this week's program. Be sure to tune into Working on Purpose, featuring your host, Dr. Elise Cortez, each week on W4CY. Together, we'll create a world where business operates conscientiously, leadership inspires in passion performance, and employees are fulfilled in work that provides the meaning and purpose they crave. See you there. Let's work on purpose.